Hey, what's up, y'all? This is the Wave Hansen YouTube channel. My name's Steve Howell. I'm so excited to share this YouTube clip with you. Recently, I interviewed Robert Edward Grant for the Wave Hansen podcast, and it was fascinating. Robert has an, a wild, interesting perspective, fresh, and it's, uh, it was a great podcast. Go take a listen. But I'm so happy you're watching this video right now. And what I'm about to show you is a, a little clip of what went on in that, in that meeting. And Robert shared the secrets of Nikola Tesla. He created a video not too long ago decoding what Tesla meant with his fascination with three, six, and nine. I'm so excited to share this with you today. Like, subscribe, all that. Thanks for watching. I know Nikola Tesla said the importance of the numbers three, six, and nine are incredible. What What is your understanding of, of Tesla's sentence there? Well, you know what, actually, can I do a, a share with you? Yeah, please. Uh, so I'm going to uh, do a quick screen share and uh, I'm gonna take you to a video because I think this will be good. It explains the answer to that question. And this is a video that I made uh, not long ago called Quaternion Symmetry uh, with my colleague, Alan Green. Out of the void came one voice, and the one became many. And the many became chaos. For they knew not their place within the whole symphony. Until, under the guiding principles of order, discipline, balance, measure, time, and harmony, the many remembered again their oneness. Could it be that science, hearing the sound of many waters within the seemingly chaotic interference patterns of our reality, has forgotten the art of listening for that one vibration? When circular waves encounter others, they create vesica Pisces patterns within themselves. And this repetitive dance of duplication actually creates everything we experience in our daily lives. Science tells us it's all nothing but waveforms and mathematical probabilities. But in 2018, Robert Grant compared many of the known math and physical constants against their fractals or inverse decimal and angular values on a circle, expanding upon the study of quaternion symmetry. Nikola Tesla asserted that the secrets of the universe are embedded in the numbers 3, 6, and 9. And so, Grant postulated the hexagonal integer 6 to be the center, the mirror reflection crossover point from which, radiating outward, numbers converge and overlap at various nodes. He hypothesized that numbers both create and emerge out of these wave propagations and thus all constants manifest at the geometrical intersections between their x and one of x representations. The first of these conjunctions occurs at the center where the golden ratio phi and its one over x little phi manifest. These are framed by the euler mascheroni constant gamma and its close inverse, the square root of three. The next conjunctions manifest fractals of pi and the Euler number E. 
These are framed by the cubed root of gamma and a light speed reference, C, against E minus 2 and a presently unknown new constant. The next conjunction manifests the squares of phi, framed by its square root and the fine structure constant, alpha, giving rise to yet another pair of new constants. At the Tesla integers 3 and 9, we find pi and its 1 over x fractal, which reveal 3.1623, a most significant balance between pi and its inverse, producing two more brand new constants. Moving further out, each subsequent framing simultaneously converges and diverges like concave and convex lenses, concentrating and dispersing energy. Thus we can see visually how the separation of light and dark is achieved mathematically. And perhaps we begin to understand more fully how the Einsteinian concept itself of space-time emanates from precisely such a dynamic wave function. As already shown, this new understanding predicts that at each halving of a wave, another mirroring constant must inherently result from the convergence. We are therefore able to predict with mathematical certainty where new, presently unknown constants will be found along an infinitely ever-expanding wave. Thus, from a simple x against 1 over x analysis, a unifying mathematical theory emerges, revealing an elegant structure hidden within an age-old mystery. Since all the major constants, pi, phi, e, alpha, appear at these convergences, and presently unknown constants are now geometrically predictable, we see they are all pure quaternion reflections of the most fundamental constant of all, the integer 1. These findings even suggest that ancient references to a voice of many waters may literally be an accurate metaphor. Developing a unique variant of the original Pythagorean tuning which postulates that true A above middle C should be 432 cycles per second, or hertz. Grant has found that the musical notes themselves emerge from the intersections of these overlapping waves. Their hertz values correspond exactly to their angular relationships on a circle, requiring only minimal equal temperament adjustments to become a viable tuning alternative. And thus we have come, one might say, full circle to the pure, balanced alchemy of science and art, resolving the chaos of the many back into the unity of the one. Wow. That feels like a key to the whole universe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I had no idea. Um, I, I knew some about you and what you've done. And, right you know, now. if you looked at your LinkedIn page, it's... <laughs> Hang on one second. You're looking at a this, uh, the YouTube thing is going on. <laughs> it's going on to some other interesting <laughs> stuff here. <laughs> but, but, oh, right. here it is. Here it is. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so back now. So sorry, go ahead. You've you've really unlocked the keys of the universe. Well, I mean, I don't think I've unlocked all of them. Like, like I said, the more I learn, the less I feel I know. And, um, you know, I, I think looking at math as a language uh, was, uh, was a, just a difference in perspective. And once I looked at it as a language, then I could start to see all kinds of patterns and things that um, were very beautiful to me. And it has been uh, very powerful for me. And, you know, I, during the quarantine, I was teaching people how to draw geometry in this course that I had called uh, 
philosophical geometry and I was shocked to see that it had like millions of views now and how people were, you know, while on their quarantine, taking advantage of the time to, to learn some of this language of math and geometry. And it was, uh, it was a great blessing for me. I, I learned so much through the process too. Um, you know, nobody learns as much as the teacher because you're kind of forced to really rethink a lot of the, the suppositions and, and maybe some of the conditioning that I had come to some of the conclusion of that. And I changed a lot of my, I opened rather, not changed. You know, I think that's another thing is I opened my thinking to other perspectives as a result of that, that class. I don't, I don't see myself anymore as changing my mind because changing my mind on something is kind of like saying that what I was thinking before was wrong. It's not necessarily wrong. It's just that, you know, I was able to see one aspect of the cylinder and maybe that aspect was that it's a circle. So evolving my thinking or expanding my thinking to understanding that there's another, you know, a Z axis, there's a depth, on that thinking and that there's a potentiality for it being a cylinder. Um, so then another party might see the same thing as a rectangle. That's an expansion of thought. It's not that I was wrong. You know, the, the parable or the allegory of the elephant, right? Which is everyone's touching the elephant with blindfolds on or blind men touching the elephant rather. And one man says, oh, you know, it's a wall. The other man says, oh, it's a, it's a column. I feel like a big Dorian kind of column here. And another man says, oh, it's a spear because they're touching the, the tip of the tusk. Uh, another person might say, oh, it's a rope, you know, because they're feeling the tail. And it's not that each one of them is wrong. It's just their own different viewpoint of a limited understanding of experience. And it's not about changing your mind. It's not like one person would say, okay, I'm going to dogmatically argue that this is a wall and you think it's a column, but I'm going to prove it's a wall, right? That's kind of how the universe would probably look at us saying, well, this is kind of funny, yeah, right? Because it's kind of, we're all missing the point altogether. Maybe the construct of what is right and wrong is the first place that we're starting from that is maybe the illusion, right? And so how do you teach that to not change, but open someone's mind to it? You're dealing with sorts of, uh, you're dealing with their conditioning and what they've thought. And a mentor of mine says, everyone's doing the best they can. And so you take this into account and uh, they can't do anything other than what they're doing right now. They're a collection of the past, the experiences, how do you open their, their mind? So, you know, it's interesting. I get this question a lot about the earth being flat, <laughs> which is okay. Cause someone says, okay, if there's not a right and wrong, then how do you reconcile the earth, you know, being a sphere versus being flat? And I'm like, okay. So first of all, I can understand that someone seeing this cylinder might actually see it as a flat circle. I can understand that. Maybe if I'd never traveled, if I'd never been on an airplane that flew around the world and I flew west and I ended up all the way coming back around from the east and landing back in the United States, right? Then maybe um, I could understand that. I've also flown over the South Pole. You know, people talk about it all the time. Oh, that's not legal. That's urban myth because I've flown over the South Pole. I've seen it. I've been in, a, in an airplane flying from Tierra del Fuego to Australia, okay? And if I hadn't had that experience, then I may not necessarily have the, the ability just to rely on someone else telling me that the Earth is a sphere. It's not just a sphere, it's a hypersphere. It's in rapid motion, it's like a gimbal. And we don't even perceive it. If I, if I couldn't have the perspective of stepping outside of myself, I couldn't see how it's even possible that the earth could be spinning right now at about a thousand miles an hour and traveling through space at about, you know, within the solar system at a speed of 67,000 miles an hour and then traveling within our solar system around the galaxy at a speed of 500,000 miles an hour. Now think about that for a moment. That's a lot to comprehend, right? Yeah. But at the same time, 
if I think about the atoms inside my body, right, they're traveling at super speed. And the electrons traveling around those atoms are traveling near the speed of light. So it's all about perspective. It's all about perspective. And, you know, once you, you know, you think about a grasshopper. Let's say a grasshopper lives in a field. The grasshopper will perceive that the entire universe is the field it lives in. Right? It might be the garden yeah. at my house. My wife is going nuts because we have a raccoon. And since quarantine, we set up a garden. And so she's got this zucchini thing. And, and I swear, I'm like joking with her every night. She's like Elmer Fudd. She's out there trying to figure out how to get rid of this raccoon that's eating all of her zucchinis. Yeah. Right. And every night she's putting something else out. Last night was hilarious. She put out like flour all around it. We have a little camera that's a motion sensor camera, but somehow this little raccoon bandito.